intro, a whole heap of stuff about John. Everyone will know his background, what he's done in the game. Uh, just hand straight over to John to take us off to his first session. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks, fellas. Just, uh, you know, just talking about uh, all the Samoans and uh, Tongans and uh, Maori players that we, we're getting into the NRL at the moment. I, I was the first Warriors coach, and. When I put together the squad over there, you know, I, I sort of knew that I wanted to get a back that knew how to play in the NRL. So I recruited Greg Alexander. Um, we looked for a front rower and we recruited Ian Roberts, who reneged on the deal at the last minute. Um, we got Phil Blake um, and Noah Thompson, who's uh, Jared Maines' father. Um, so, we sort of brought in some, some experienced players, but, but what we also did was we tried to bring all the Kiwi players that were playing all over the world, we tried to bring them back to New Zealand to play. And we, we did a pretty good job. We got, we, you know, we got a lot of good players and, and uh, um, you know, we missed out on Nick out because of, of some family things that he had going and he didn't want to come. And we, we missed out on um, Jared McCracken, he didn't want to come. But we got a lot of the good young players. We've got Stephen Kearney came back. We've got Dean Bell back from who have been playing at Wigan. Um, and what I found about those players was that, that they really need a leader, you know, an on-field leader. They, they needed somebody on the field that, that they had <laughs> respect and, and they, they call it mana, that, that had some mana. And, uh, we, we missed the semi-finals in the first year by, by one win. And, and, but some of the problems I had were, were cultural things. And before I went there, I, I thought, you know, I thought they were all married. So I, I didn't really think they were married. I knew there were some some islands. And, but they, they tend to get in all their little groups. And, and, and they, 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 they do need somebody that they think is a leader that they're prepared to follow on the field. So I think when they came over to the Sydney clubs, because they're magnificent uh, physical athletes, you know, they're, they're everything we want in a rugby league player, physically. And, uh, and, and you can put the weight on them and you can do all sorts of things. But the Sydney clubs tended to only get three or four or five. And all of a sudden I was in Auckland setting up the Warriors and we had 40. We had a few cultural problems and, and the first road trip we had when we had to come to Australia to play our first game, we were in the hotel the first night. We uh, the conditioner came out of the room. And he said, "Oh, he said, I just come down the corridor. You wouldn't believe what was happening." He said, uh, "A lot of the Samoan guys they were taking their mattresses and they were all going down to the one room. They're all going to sleep in the same room." He said, "He got a problem with that." I said, "Oh, we're playing tomorrow. We're playing the next day. You know, just let them sleep where they want to sleep." So then he said, but he said, I don't think that's the biggest problem. He said, you should see the food that they got in the room. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the smaller sports became our enemy. And you know, after we'd been to Australia to play a game, when we came up, we'd weigh them the next day and they put on a couple of KGs with, with all the food that they'd eat. So there, there was all these little changes that we had to make and we started giving them food packs that we made up in New Zealand, that we made them bring to Australia so they wouldn't eat too much, you know, they could only eat with the, what was in their food pack. And then we get to the airport, and then they go to McDonald's at the airport. And, um, so we, we sort of had all these problems, and, and you know, the, I, I look back on it now, and, and I didn't think it was a huge problem at the time, and I didn't think travelling was a huge problem at the time, but it, but it really was. And, you know, there's some cultural differences there that you've, that you've just got to make for those particular players. But the bottom line is that if you've got a system that you're trying to coach, you know, if, if, if you've got systems in place and you know how much hard work you've got to do and you know how much repetition you've got to do, well, the bottom line is those players have got to fit into your system. You know, you can't have 20, a squad of 25 players and, and be changing the rules for three or four players at, at, all the, at all the clubs. Now I know now when you go back through um, individual clubs, 
there might be 12 islanders in that club at all different levels, you know, there might be two in the top grade, there might be five in the next grade, and there might be 10 on scholarships at different schools. So all of a sudden they're starting to get a, a better education of the Australian system, which for rugby league players is, it's, it's a very tough system, you know. When our kids come through and they come through, I suppose a lot of you coaches are, you know, coach at schoolboy level and, and coach at junior level. But when young players come through our system and they get to grade level, they're very, very tough players, you know. They have been dropped a lot of times. They have been kicked up the bum by coaches, you know. They have had discipline uh, drilled into them. So when they get, when a young Australian player, and, and the Islands is a part of that now, when they do get through to the grade level, uh, they do accept the disciplines and the hard work that you've got to have to make it in the NRL. They do accept those a lot better. So I think if, if you know, the players that come through the Australian system uh, mentally and physically much tougher than, than players that have encountered over the rest of the world. I always think coaching is, is getting, getting the best out of the players that you've, that you've dealt with. You know, we always can't have the best players and we always can't have the players that that we think we can win with. But sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet and say, okay, how, how much can I get out of these players? And, you know, there, there's, there's indicators that, that, you know, stuff that we say, well, let's see if we can get this player to, to improve in this area. Um, you know, there's other players. Most of the players that play for us can do something good. And, you know, as I've got older and I've stopped coaching, I've realised that, um, that, you know, you really our coaching job is to get something out of those players. I coached for 21 years and, and I never coached at, at a junior level. But for the 21 years I coached at, the, the only script that really the people that employed me, that gave me, was that I had to win a game every week. And if I won a game every week and we won some things, then I got paid better and I kept my job. And that worked pretty good, but like Wadey, I got sacked three times. So, you know, and I got sacked at Wigan where I'd won 16 trophies in five years and won five, five, we'd won the comp five years in a, in a row. We'd been to Wembley four years, we'd been to Wembley five years and won four Wembleys in a row. So at Wigan, I won 16 trophies. The season we, the season I got sacked, we'd played five games and we'd lost four of them. So the new owner sacked me. So you're never safe in the coaching game. So if anybody's looking for a job where they think they can, gee, this is a career path for me, um, you know, you shouldn't be thinking about coaching because everybody gets sacked. And you know, you probably haven't been around long enough if you haven't. And I've always maintained that time is a coach's enemy. One thing I haven't got as a coach is enough time. So being an old fashioned coach, I'm the sort of coach that says, do this. When we're there and we're on that try line and we want to get to over the 40 metre line, we'll do safety sets. I said, because if you do them properly and you do them consistently and you can do them under pressure, we won't make a mistake. Therefore, we'll get over the 40 metre line and we'll kick the far corner <laughs> and we'll chase down so when they get it, they'll have 100 metres to Good plan. <laughs> so, so I said, I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you three or four safety sets. Now again, being an experienced coach, I know that we talk about player empowerment. Let the players discover things and let them do what they're going to do. I said, okay, so one of the safety sets, when we get the ball, on the first tackle, I want you to string three or four passes together, or once it's gone past three passes, I want whoever's way over there front as hard as they can. And then, so we shift it from where the, the fucking, over there on the first play, then we'll start our safety set over there and we'll roll. And we'll roll by hitting a power play, which is the front man, or if you want to hit the second man, and then the halfbacks are sitting in behind the roll on players, so that'll be our, shift the safety set. And I said, if we want to do a second man safety set, 
back and back into it. We want to go down that corridor, stay in that corridor every time we get wider than the 20 metre line, bring it back there, but that one was too complicated. <laughs> so I had to can the corridor. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, we came up we came up with three or four safety sets that, that we could do really well and we could keep the ball down there. There. So I'll address that now. When we get over the halfway and we get the ball anywhere from the 40 metre line, so we've got 60 metres to play with. I said we'll either take the ball to the 20 or we'll take it to the 50. So the 20 is marked on the, on the line. The 50 is that black dot. So I said the front rowers have got one or two rucks to get us to the 50. 